Thank you so much for joining us today, uh, Tina Gridiron from the Lumina Foundation. I know you got a plane to catch, so I'm glad you're kind of you know adjusting your schedule a little bit to do this earlier before your keynote. Um, but we wanted to sit down with you to ask you some questions about the landscape that our opportunity programs are entering in this new day, day and age. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges facing um, adult students, which you're seeing a, you know, an increase uh, over the past five, 10 years? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the challenges that, that we're facing and how can we really address those challenges? Thank you so much for the question. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, Lumina Foundation has been watching the trends focused on adults for the past 14 years. For the past six years, we've actually tracked um, the numbers of students that have some college but no degree. Those are individuals that started their college experience either at a two-year or four-year institution, but then failed to secure an associate's degree or credential or certificate of any kind. And what we know is there are over 23 million of those individuals in the U.S. today. And currently, we need approximately 12 million of those individuals to come back to college in order for our nation to reach 60% of the U.S. population with high quality credentials and degrees by the year 2025. Mm -hmm. So in order for those adults to come back and succeed in higher education when we know they experienced some challenges yes. the first time around, institutions have uh, some work to do to make it, one, a welcoming environment. Uh, for adults who are going part-time, who often has, have family and children obligations to juggle, who often need a very structured schedule mm. that allows them to uh, take courses in the morning block or in the afternoon block. Um, so there's some scheduling and uh, institutional culture opportunities that must be put in place in order to make uh, higher education success a, um, a stronger possibility for adults. So I would say some structural opportunities opportunities or some structural uh, transitions need to be put in place at institutions. We know that um, adult students are gravitating to online or hybrid learning experiences where they attend class maybe once a month and mm -hmm. then every week yeah. have some type of online experience. We know that technology is advancing such that you can have um, uh, Skype conversations, you can have uh, chatter opportunities, you can even have group learning experiences and co-designing projects projects using lots of technology um, opportunities. And so uh, institutions that have a robust online experience that is not just an add-on to the in-class experience, but is part of the learning experience creates a rich opportunity for adults to, uh, one, meet their needs of not coming to campus as often mm -hmm. so that they can do work from home and two, uh, creating more flexibility for the student to watch um, the lecture, if you will, at two o'clock in the morning after yeah. the kids are asleep and all of the chores are done for the day. So some structures, um, block scheduling, uh, one that is often helpful for adults so they can let their employers know. Yeah. I have classes every morning from nine until 12 for the next year and a half, mm -hmm. so I can work after 12. So that is one helpful online uh, or hybrid learning experiences is another um, opportunity for adults. And the third that I would just um, uh, share with you is we know that adults are learning in many different venues, not just what they experience in the classroom and at the institution, but they're learning on the job. Many are learning uh, through service experience, whether they're in the military or if they uh, do uh, um, uh, abroad uh, community service opportunities. We know that learning happens in many different places and experiences in an adult's life. What are the mechanisms that the institution can put in place in order to capture that learning and help the student get credit for that learning once they are ready for a traditional educational experience, whether it be a two-year or four-year degree? So how do we um, create mechanisms for prior learning assessments? There's an organization called the Center for Education, oh, uh, Center for Adult Education and Learning, CALE, mm -hmm. that does a lot of great work uh, uh, collaborating with students, with adults, mm -hmm. and tracking all the learning that they've experienced outside of the institution and packaging it with units or with credits for the benefit of the student once they're inter interested in a traditional experience. So looking at prior learning assessment opportunities and structuring your institution's admissions policies such that students can get credit for learning that happened elsewhere would be a third way to op create opportunities for adults to increase completion. 
And, and our theme for the conference is changing paradigms. And when we're talking about this particular population, has, yes. which has been increasing more and more every yes. year, we do have to make those shifts sooner than later. And it sounds like what you're telling me is that we, it's, we don't necessarily have to always have to have that kind of change from within. We can partner with organizations like Kale yes. uh, and really see the solutions outside of the institutional walls and Absolutely. partner with those organizations. Any other organizations that we should be um, taking a look at and in partnering with or just exploring those options besides those? Oh, in serving adult learners, um, we know that there are, uh, I would say the military, um, any branch of the military mm. is uh, doing a very good job at uh, training their, imp their service men and women in lots of different skills and abilities. And so is your institution um, uh, already mapping the learning that happens in the service with the mm -hmm. learning that's happening at the institution so it's a seamless transition? Many institutions are engaged in that work, but some still have room to grow. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, there is the Adult College Completion Network. It mm -hmm. is a, a consortia of many different um, think tanks, not-for-profits, advocacy organizations mm -hmm. that are yeah. structured to look at what are the barriers and challenges facing adults, what are right techniques and opportunities that institutions can put in place, and how can we message to adults that higher education is welcoming mm -hmm. to them, is interested in them coming back. Uh, so I would also lift up the Adult College Completion Network, ACCN, as a great resource for institutional leaders that just want to check out more information related to adults. Yeah, we'll have this in the show notes so that people can click and, and explore those, those things. But it's really important to note that as opportunity programs, our resources are limited and we don't necessarily have to recreate the wheel. That's fair. We really need to um, look outside the, the thing outside the box and partner with these organizations and take a look at it. So we'll have it then show notes. So thanks for sharing, sharing that with us. Um, you mentioned or we, we, we looked at that Luminous 60% uh, goal is very ambitious and for you, you know, what will you do if Lumina doesn't receive? Tell us more about the 60% goal and what would you do if, is that, if that's not reached? So, um, as I will share my presentation later this afternoon, uh, Lumina believes that our country needs to reach 60% of the U.S. population with high quality credentials and degrees by the year 2025. The foundation did not come up with that um, percentage or that date on our own. We turned to Georgetown University's Center for Education in the Workforce. We looked at research done by labor economists, by um, individuals that look at trends for the workforce, and they have let us know that by 2020, we need at least 65% of the population with high quality credentials and degrees. The kinds of jobs that are being created for the future require education beyond high school. Now, uh, Lumina currently is tracking what success we're seeing as a nation at the two-year associate's degree level and at the four-year baccalaureate degree level. We also know that there's a body of individuals that are securing credentials and certificates through their workplace opportunities as well as through their institutional experiences. What we know is current data sets and data tracking mechanisms do not allow us to capture what's happening for those individuals that have high quality certificates and credentials. For example, we know that there are individuals in the technology arena that can have a strong livable wage with a strong certificate from Google Microsoft. or certification yeah. from Microsoft. Or, um, so we want to uh, look at the system of higher education and find ways to seamlessly connect the learning that happens in other places with the learning that's happening in higher education. Currently, our system is not designed to capture that learning and to give the student credit for what they know and are able to do. So, you asked, what will we do if we don't reach that 60% goal? Well, I must say that Lumina believes we will reach the 60% goal. Currently, our nation is at 40% of the U.S. population with high quality credentials and degrees, according to the census. We believe that it is possible to get to 60%, not just because once we understand how to um, capture learning for certif uh, certifications and credentials, that there would be a, a large jump from 40% to closer to 60%. But if we do our job right to connect with adult students, which we just talked about, we um, have great promise to get to that 60% goal. If we continue to do business as usual, spending most of our time focused on 18-year-olds uh, that go to four-year institutions and have a residential experience, if we stay the course, there is no way we will reach the 60% goal. Lumina Foundation, however, 
is spending time with leaders from institutions all across the country, uh, think tank uh, individuals, researchers all across the country that have uh, looked at what is required and it is possible mm -hmm. to reach the 60% goal. The opportunity before us is do we have champions to make it happen? Institutional leaders like those attending this conference need to be um, lifted up more and they need to engage in their work at scale, not just for 20 students or 100 students, but if your campus has 13,000 students, how, how about we uh, engage in a stretch goal so that we see more of those students engaging in the great opportunities, the great programs, the great uh, services and support um, opportunities that are being uh, made available and that are thriving at the campuses attending this conference today. Yeah, and so it sounds, it sounds like there is, uh, it's definitely feasible um, in so much that you're able to quantify, work closer with those uh, organizations that do offer those certificates, mm -hmm. but also when we have, uh, programs like ours, like opportunity-based programs, who create win-win conversations that we already need that resources for those non-traditional students, yeah. but also it's in the, in the interest of the institution as a whole yes. to really buy into this vision and tap into that. Um, and we, having people like you really helps us out. Thank you so much for that. Um, what are some of the most promising practices that institutions can adopt to increase this attainment and close that achievement gap? Because, I mean, we, we've known about this problem and this deficit for mm -hmm. some time. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, maybe our popular, our, our, uh, those who attend the conference may not hear too much the, the, the best practices mm -hmm. or know what success looks like. Can you elaborate on that? Fair enough, fair enough. So uh, one of the gifts in my life is that I work for a foundation that is a mm -hmm. national foundation and I spend time mm -hmm. with experts all across the country. Um, and I hear from institutional leaders like Valencia Community College, like Georgia State University, like Arizona State University, like El Paso, University of Texas at El Paso, or El Paso Community College, or SUNY and CUNY for that matter. Mm -hmm. There are lots of institutional leaders that um, have looked at the demographics of their student population and have decided we are not going to continue business as usual. So some of the interventions that are being put in place, uh, reverse transfer. If there is a two-year and four-year institution in close proximity to each other, and we know that there's a steady pipeline of students That's at right. the two-year that are transferring to uh, the said four-year institution, um, how do we make sure that the student secures both their associate's degree and their bachelor's degree as they make that transition? Many students transfer without their associate's degree mm -hmm. and then come in, uh, in, on, into contact with challenges at the four-year institution and then leave before they get the four-year. If we engage in um, systemic and structured reverse transfer policies and practices so that the two-year and four-year are talking to each other, the minute the student has secured all the credits at the four-year to complete the two-year, because they started at the two-year and there's a partnership, the associate's degree is automatically awarded. Mm -hmm. That is a way to help, one, a student get the credential that they earned. Mm -hmm. Uh, achieve a milestone that then motivates them to push them further to four-year completion and creates um, a very uh, successful pipeline of information between the two-year and four-year which is going to serve all students well not mm -hmm. just transfer mm -hmm. students because if you align your institutional resource research offices data collection process if you align your admissions policy so that there's clear understanding of what courses easily transfer then any student attending yeah. either one of those institutions has a better experience. Yeah. So reverse transfer is one of the structures that we see institutions putting in place that affects success at scale and not just uh, in pilot um, populations of 20 or 100 students. Another opportunity, we know that many students, first generation, low income students of color, are starting their college experience having to take one, two, three, sometimes four developmental and remedial education classes. And so we are seeing um, great success with developmental and remedial education being revamped on many college campuses so that it is not a um, experience where you take the three developmental courses, you must pass those before you can go into credit bearing. Instead, we're seeing co-requisite developmental and remedial education as another strategy to help accelerate a student's time through those areas that they need to strengthen and get them to the credit bearing courses where they actually are feeling energized and excited and motivated about their educational experience. So another strategy is co-requisite developmental and remedial education. A third strategy that we know assists not just adult learners but students who 
when you get a course catalog and it has 300 pages yeah. and the student is not quite sure which courses they actually want to take within those 300 uh, pages, we know that block scheduling and um, uh, creating structured uh, learning programs so that a student is choosing from set A, set B, or set C. They don't have to choose from 300 pages. They just have to decide, do you want an early morning set? Do you want an afternoon set? Or do you want an evening set of courses? And these are the prescribed courses. What we have found is a menu of 300 pages actually is daunting, mm -hmm. challenging, and does not encourage the student to make strong choices that lead to a degree in two years or four years. We find that students end up swirling or spiraling mm -hmm. or taking too many credits that then don't add up to a degree and then extending their time. So block schedules, structured schedules, a more um, intentional um, uh, menu of courses that are locked at particular times. Mm -hmm. One helps a student to have a, a life outside of their educational experience, mm -hmm. if they have family and children, if they need to work. Two, to make better choices about courses that are going to lead to a degree. And three, decrease the time that it takes to get to a degree. We need to make success um, not an accident, mm -hmm. but an expectation. I don't know about you, but when I was in college, I was told to look to the right and look to the left. And by the way, two of you are not going to be here yes, at the end of four years. Lot, I heard still. that rhetoric when I went to college some many years ago that I'd hate to share online. Nevertheless, we know that for our nation to get to that 60% goal, for our nation to remain globally uh, participatory, globally competitive, for our country to continue to thrive, we need all three of those individuals mm -hmm. to make it across the finish line to completion. I guarantee you that students started their two-year and started their four-year experience expecting to graduate. Mm -hmm. They did not start expecting hoping. or hoping that they would drop out or hoping that they would stop out or hoping that they would just spend some time hanging out. Students have high aspirations. The question is, how do we create structures that allow them to reach the goals and the dreams that they've set for themselves? That's amazing. Well, this is just um, before the keynote, so if you're not a tri-state, you're missing out on these gems that are being dropped right now. And this, those three things that you mentioned um, are really ambitious, but I, what you, the, the, the implications and the byproducts of what you're mentioning is really important as a starting point for, for moving this forward, because I agree uh, the psychology of the student plays a role in uh, retention and mm -hmm. persistence and graduation. Um, and those solutions that you're talking about um, might seem ambitious, but we're opportunity programs. When we talk about the ability to take those uh, statistics, when people say, look to your left, look to your right, we've beaten those statistics, we've overcome, and we've shown that opportunity programs are at, have done successful things with even limited resources. So I, th I think opportunity programs are really at the forefront to be able to take this on and say it's possible, it's doable, um, let's make it happen. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm looking forward. This is just a taste for me, but to, to see you at the keynote, I'm really excited, looking forward to it. If you guys are missing on the Tri-State Consortium, uh, we'll have some of the links to uh, the resources uh, Tina has mentioned and also uh, the PowerPoint that you're going to be presenting. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank it was you. A it's great my pleasure, pleasure to be here. Thank, thank you. you.